getting there. We're getting there, I promise. Uh, Glenn, you want to come forward? Uh, everyone here, most everyone here knows Glenn. And Glenn is he's a founding member of the church. Uh, him and his wife um, have. Uh, yeah, his wife Glennis. Yeah, not in for today. Uh, him, he and his wife, Glennis, have recently purchased a property in Wimberley, and uh, they're going to be moving shortly. So he asked if he could just share a few things and tell his story uh, about what has happened over the past couple of years. So he, I'm going to give him an opportunity to do that here this morning, okay? I'm going to try to do, be real fast because uh, there's so much that God has done. Y'all can have a seat. <laughs> we're going. We, it just takes us a minute to get moving. But we're moving. <laughs> but as y'all as y'all know, uh, been involved in the church since the start. God has done so much in my life. And so much to this church. <laughs> and I wouldn't be here today if it wouldn't be for this church. So I might get teary eyed for all this story, little story. This is just really quick because I, I didn't really prepare any, any. I got slides and stuff that I want to make of a good presentation. But, but back in October uh, 2020, we took a week uh, to go spend time on our property in Arkansas, and uh, we went and we were enjoying the. The property, enjoying the com community, and we went ATV riding the, on the seventh, which is Wednesday the seventh, October the seventh. We were in the middle of no no man's land, 37 miles from cell phone reception or anything. We were rode all through the ATV park, enjoyed it. Got great fall pictures, got great pictures of waterfalls and things that we went to. It was only. You know, it's only, uh, I said 37 miles from cell phone, but 37 miles from our, from our home, and it's about 20 miles from the major town. So. But anyway, we're in National Forest, and enjoyed the whole day, and came back and had a beautiful sunset on our patio. <coughs> God, God really started speaking to me that night. And I didn't know what was going to happen, <laughs> but he was assuring me that, that he is in control of our life. And I knew that night that something was going to happen. I didn't know what. <laughs> anyway. The morning started out very, very good. I had the plumber show up and uh, I had to put a uh, shutoff valve going to my shop and dig down and put a shutoff valve. I didn't have a shutoff valve and had to get it winterized to isolate that shop because it had a half bath in it uh, from the winter. And uh, so the plumber showed up, and we dug and put a valve, dug, dug up a line, and put a valve. And I said, "I'll cover it up. Don't worry about it." And he went on, and I covered up the trench and and put bricks around it, put a water box, I mean, a box in, and everything. And, and uh, I got done with that, and I, Glenn said, "Well, I think I'm going to go to the dollar store." And I said, "I'm fine. I'm going to go ahead and move over. I'm going to do the light timer." to our lights out, out there. We had lights on the light timer uh, going to our trees on the dry, line of the driveway. And I had a timer bad. And I, and I uh, told her I was going to work on that while she was at the dollar store. It was probably about, I think, uh, my phone. It's the last picture. I was taking pictures of the wiring in the timer box. And communicating with my brother, talking to my brother, and say, because it was different. And I said, "How do I want to hook this in series, or how do I want to do this?" And uh, and I got the phone with him. I took a picture of the wires and took a picture of the wiring on the box. And then I put the new box in, and then all of a sudden I couldn't operate the screwdriver. 
couldn't turn my hand. And I said, what in the world's going on? And I can't even operate the screwdriver. And uh, I was kneeling down at the time box and I stood up and I had no right leg. No, nothing on the right side. And I said, this is, this is strange, <laughs> very strange. And I uh, called my brother back and I said, well, I don't know what just happened, but something just happened. I, not, just my right side is numb and I, I can't function my right side. And he says, that's not good. He said, where's Clintus? And I said, it's a dollar store with Kristen, her daughter. He said, is anybody there? And I said, well, Christian's boyfriend's here, and he's in the house up front. And I'm out, out in, the, in the yard, and, and she, he said, well, you call Glennis, and then I'm going to text too and tell him to get him <coughs> out to watch you. And I drug myself over the lawnmower. I just kind of drug myself over the lawnmower, selling the lawnmower. I had the lawnmower out there. And I just sat there, and I, was, I felt fine. I was totally fine. And uh, and uh, when my brother said stroke, I, I kind of said, I think you're right, but I think it was kind of mini stroke. You know, I'll be all right. And, uh, so anyway, Glennis, I called Glennis and told her she better get home. I was okay, but she better get home. She says, we're checking out. And she's in town, it's about eight miles, I guess, in, into the, the Mount Ida. And I told her, I said, uh, well, get, just come on home, and when you get home, and we'll sit, be sitting on the lawnmower. Just, and when you get here, we'll decide if we're going to call the ambulance or we're gonna, you're going to take me to the hospital. Because uh, it's a volunteer fire department, and it's... Probably about 15, 20 minutes for them to respond, and then another 15, 20 minutes to get on the way to the hospital. So I knew Glenn's could probably get in the hospital soon. So anyway, she got there. Boyfriend came out of the house, and he was afraid to touch me, so he was just circling along, more watching, looking after me. <laughs> and uh, Glenn's got there. I said, "I'm all right. Thank you. Get the car." I said, "Yeah, oh yeah, I get in the car." So we got. I got in the car, and I was just. She was just too stressed out. And I said, God really gave me a deal. I'm going to be okay. He's, he's got this. I said, there, you know they're just going to give me medicine and send me home. <laughs> so I, we were just jabbing all the way to the hospital. 37 miles. So, anyway, we got to the hospital. And of course, she parked in the in the regular parking and not the emergency room parking and they had COVID protocols going on. And so down the hill, it's probably here at the well house out there, I, I looked down and I said, okay, well, I'll make it to the door because you didn't get close. And I made it to the door and I sat down and they were dealing with somebody else and it's, like I said, they wouldn't let people in the door. So I sat out there and sat out there. And finally got to Glennis, and she's getting all the insurance information. I said, I looked at her, I said, just tell them I had a stroke. <laughs> and they looked at one one look at me and said, oh. And I mean, oh. I mean, it was it was a matter of 10 seconds. So the gurney was out there, and I was on the stretcher. I was on the way to back the CAT scan. And I was... I still thought I would be, which I was, but thought I was going to be okay. I was going to be out of there in a few minutes. The last thing I remember was going into the tube. That's the last thing I remember. And I woke up about three days later, or two days later. And I didn't know where I was. But what happened all during after time when I had to when I had the CAT scan, Glenn said that they they saw that I had a hemorrhagic stroke. 
brain bleed. And they yelled out, I got a bleeder, I got a bleeder. And they called life like. I don't remember any of it. She said they told her to go home and get her clothes and head to Little Rock because life flight was on the way. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, my 10 minutes is already up. Take your time. I knew I was going to be okay, but I don't remember any of that. And uh, that's sixty-two thousand dollars that I don't remember that life flight. <laughs> I said, at least I can remember that flight, right? <laughs> For sixty-two thousand dollars. But anyway, uh, Gona said that she didn't see life flights. So they already sent her home to get the clothes and meet them in Little Rock. Meet me in Little Rock. But then when she got to Little Rock, they wouldn't let her in. So she just sat out in the parking lot. What good is she do to get her? And they, did, they wouldn't give her any updates. And finally she got a hold of the nurse and said, look, I've been sitting out here, it's midnight or whatever. I want to go home. So she got in and drove all the way from Little Rock all the way back to Mount Ida, which is, uh, I think it's about 75 to 100 miles. I can't remember. 100 miles. Or 100 and something miles, anyway. So uh, she drove back and there. And uh, all I remember is waking up, um, and I was in Little Rock, and I didn't know what hospital I was in, but I couldn't do anything, and all I can remember is all these people. I didn't know night or day, I didn't have any windows or anything. I didn't know what time it was in the day, and, and it just sat there staring, and, uh, and nurses would come in, and they go out, and uh, even in the nights, and mixed up, and days, and they mixed up, and didn't know. The only time I knew, this was, well, I had the stroke on, on Thursday. I think it was Monday night. Uh, one of the nurses came in and said, you like football? And I said, yeah, I like football. And uh, she said, I'll turn on the TV for there's a game on. And I said, turn the TV on and you can watch football. I said, that sounds great. And this is about the time I was talking to uh, Glennis on, I guess they were uh, FaceTiming me. And somebody had a tablet. And Glenda said my faith was just blank, and I had, my faith was smooth on this side. And I knew who she was, and I knew that, but she says I didn't react like I love you or anything. I just said, I acknowledged that she was part of my life, and that was about it. <laughs> anyway, I better speed this up. But, <clears throat> but anyway, football game was on and I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> I couldn't figure out what in the world they were trying to kick that, that ball through that goal, I, whatever they call it, the goal. I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> so anyway, it's kind of funny now that I think about all that. But, but anyway, uh, just to tell you how bad I was, you know, I had a diaper on and they just rolled me over and changed my diaper and rolled me back. And I, I didn't know anything. And about four days later, five days later after the football game, they go to this, called me and said, we're getting you out of there today. And I said, no, not today. I'm not having a good day. <laughs> not today. She said, today is the day you get out of there. You've got to go to rehab. And uh, I said, it's not a good day. So the next thing you know, I'm getting crammed in a little van with a wheelchair. It's just a van, transport van. They roll me in the back of that van. I'm on the way to, to Hot Springs. <laughs> and I guess it's about an hour, an hour and a half drive from Little Rock to Hot Springs. And I was just in the van. I didn't, in a wheelchair, and I didn't know. And I could barely sit up. But anyway, long story short, Fast forward in there, I, I went to rehab three weeks in, in 
Hot Springs, and I went. He went into another hospital there. Then I went from. They finally released me to to uh, Ignatius's care. My brother came up and drove us back. But during this time, I want to tell you that the church. Y'all made a picture. Y'all took a picture up here of all y'all and sent it to me. And those pictures kept me going. <laughs> Y'all don't know how much y'all lifted me up. Because I knew the prayers. And I looked through that little book with all the prayers that y'all sent in me. And the Robert, the little things that he sent me, it kept me going. The church was such a blessing. And what I am today is because of this church. And what God has done in my life. He's right. He was right. He gave me a, you know, he gave me something that I would be okay. I'm okay. I'm back to work today. Um, things are going in life. It's going great. Ooh, God is good. God is good. So, anyway, I am moving to Wimberley. Well, I'm still working here in Houston. And I'm going to stay at my mom's during a week until I decide that that's enough. <laughs> it is coming soon. It's tick tock, tick tock. <laughs> we got a home, a retirement home, now at Wimberley. And that's Congratulations. Probably we're, we're probably going to retire there. Glenn's going to work from there. So we'll be back, uh, back and forth. And we, all of our family are here, so we'll be back. So I just want to let you know you might be seeing absence of me, but you're in my heart. It's y'all are the reason I'm here. <laughs> God, just for uh, what you have done in Glenn's life and in Glennis's life through this process, Lord. Uh, the strength that you have given Glenn and Lord and, and the ability to recover the way that he has, Lord God, we know that is solely by your grace and your mercy, Father God, and your sovereign hand at work in his life, Lord. Thank you. Uh, Father God, we are here this morning, God, to give you praise, honor and glory. You alone are worthy, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, inhabit the praises of your people here this morning, God. Uh, Lord, that you would show and reveal your presence with us here this morning, God. We give you all honor and glory. You alone are worthy. Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.
see that. Jesus is Lord of all. Amen. Amen. The Bible also tells us that Jesus, in Proverbs, it tells us that we have a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Jesus speaking to his disciples says, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. And I was just thinking about that and Glenn's story this morning and how that Jesus stuck by Glenn closer than a brother. In that church, that is the reality for all of God's children. All of those who have come in faith with Christ Jesus and accepted Him as Lord of their life, that He sticks closer than a brother through all circumstances. Amen? Amen. And we've seen that demonstrated through Glenn's life. And thank you, brother, for sharing that with us this morning. Uh, let's take a moment. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we can count Jesus as a friend to us, Lord. And to know, Lord, that... As Peter says, we can cast our cares upon you because you care for us. Lord, you know our needs greater than we do, Father God. And, and Father, you are faithful in all circumstances, all situations. You never, you know, you'll never leave us, nor will you forsake us, Lord. Uh, God, thank you for those promises that we hold to, Lord. And especially in times of such hardship, Lord God, we know, Lord, that you're true to your promises. You cannot, cannot break a promise, Lord. You are God. And Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, for your continued provision for our every need, Lord. We know and understand, Lord, that everything that we have is a gift from you, Lord. Uh, Father, we just want to pray, Lord, that today, as we now give of our tithes and offerings, Lord, that you would bless it, God, that you would multiply it, and that you would use it for your glory, for your purpose. Uh, Lord, and we just pray for your Lordship. You're leading in, in this ministry, Lord God. It's none of us. It's all of you, Lord. So, Father God, just you be magnified. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. individual books, 66 books, right, in, 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 the, in, in the context of the Holy Scriptures, the Holy Bible. 
Uh, but they weren't written by chapter and verse. They were a continuous writing. Okay, So the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church in Rome, uh, it's one continuous letter. All right, No chapters, no verses. The chapters and the verses were added for our benefit uh, so that we could study God's Word in a more clear way and, and have a better understanding and comprehension of it and also be able to... Uh, I mean, how many times have you needed a particular verse... And all of a sudden you come, oh yeah, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, you know, whatever. You know, I mean, it's the God always has it there when you need it, right? Uh, so it's, it's given in this context, in this way, by us. But sometimes I feel like people have uh, wrongly studied God's Word when they break it down in a sense where, you know, they identify, well, Paul was speaking of this, and now he's speaking about that. Well, no, it's a continued thought, okay? The Apostle Paul is just fi finishing a continued thought. And that's what we're going to be looking at here this morning. Uh, last week we talked about the Apostle Paul was talking about the word of faith that they preached. Okay, uh, He tells us exactly what that word of faith that they preached was in verse 9. He says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. And that's not a, an if or a maybe, right? Uh, Paul made it clear that you shall be saved if you confess Jesus as Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. Um, and that confession, we looked at that last week, that that word confession really means that we're in agreement with, okay? So we're in agreement with God. We don't make Jesus Lord. Jesus is Lord, okay? So when we confess, what we're doing is we're coming in agreement with that reality in our life that Jesus is Lord. And, and Lord means master, okay? Whenever we confess Jesus as Lord, we're making Him master of our lives. And we're placing ourselves under submission to His Lordship in our life, Okay? Um, but we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, but you know, then again, at the same time, right, equal to a part of that is we believe in our hearts that God raised Him from the dead. Um, and that is the power of God at work in regards to our salvation, that we understand that we know that Jesus died, but He is also risen, okay? You see, the gospel would be incomplete without the resurrection of Christ, okay? The resurrection is where Jesus defeated death in the grave. And the Bible is clear that if Christ is risen, then those who are in Christ will also rise. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians, it tells us that the dead in Christ will rise first, and then those who are left here will be caught up with Him in the clouds. Okay, so the resurrection is not just for Christ, but anyone who is in Christ, right? When, when Jesus returns for His bride, listen, we're going to be with Him eternally. Our resurrected bodies, right, uh, will be... Ever, ever, forevermore in the presence of God. Amen? Amen. That's Amen. exciting to think about, church. To know and understand that, listen, we have an eternity that's awaiting us. It's ahead of us. So, therefore, we don't have to put all of our faith and our hope and our trust in the now. I mean, we're looking with an eternal perspective because we have an eternity awaiting us that is far greater, far better than anything that we could ever experience here in this life. Amen? Amen. So that ought to bring us some great encouragement this morning. But that is the word of faith that the Apostle Paul is speaking of, right? Is that if we confess Jesus the Lord, we trust in His finished work, not our work. Okay? Our work cannot save us. It's solely by grace through faith. That's what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Right? That it's by grace you have been saved through faith. That not of yourselves is a gift of God and not of works, lest any man should boast. If we could say that we accomplished anything on our own, we'd have a, a reason to boast. But there's nothing for us to boast in because Jesus has done it all. Okay, And salvation comes by faith, placing your faith and your trust in that finished work. Okay, So that's the, that's the word of faith that the Apostle Paul is speaking of here. But now the Apostle Paul is going to make it clear that, listen, that's the word of faith, but how would they know what that word of faith is unless there's a preacher sent? Okay? Now I want to pick up here in verse 14, and I'm just going to kind of work my way through verse 14 all the way to verse 21, and then we're going to come back and we're going to kind of talk about some things uh, that I feel like the Lord has, has placed on my heart this morning. Uh, but in beginning with chapter with verse 14, and I'm just going to read through the text here, it says, How then shall they call on Him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him on, <coughs> of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. And this is Old Testament scripture. This is Isaiah prophesying of the good news, which is the gospel. That's what the gospel is. It's the good news of Christ. 
He says, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed or our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, did Israel not know? First Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. You know, for the past couple of weeks, we have seen the heart of the Apostle Paul, right? His heart for his people, Israel. How he loved Israel and his desire was that all of Israel would be saved. In fact, he, he says, I, I would even be willing to be a curse for Christ myself if that meant the salvation for the Jews. But he makes it clear that not all Israel is Israel. Not all Israel will be saved, right? And now he says, listen, because Israel has rejected, there, there's another nation, right? Another people. What is that? Well, that's anyone outside of Israel, right? Outside the Jewish faith, which is the Gentile. Um, us who are not Jews, that's who we are. We're Gentiles, okay? See, salvation was for the Jew, but also for the Gentile. And the Apostle Paul makes it clear that he was the apostle of the Gentiles, right? He preached and he, and he taught primarily the, the Gentile. And, 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 and here in Rome... This would have been primarily Gentiles with whom the Apostle Paul was ministering to. But the Apostle Paul says this word of faith that we preach, that I have been entrusted with, um, this word of faith, how would they have heard if they did not have a preacher? Okay. Now this word preacher, uh, I believe that this is speaking probably primarily to the office of, 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 of of preacher, right? The, the the elder, right? The one with whom was given and entrusted uh, the teaching of the word of God to the congregation, uh, but also church. There's a there's a sense in which we all, as followers of Jesus Christ, are preachers of the gospel, because preaching is declaring. Okay, it's revealing. In fact, that word there comes from a Greek word called kariso, and it means to publish or proclaim. To publish means something means you make it public, right? You make it known. And church, we've all been given that duty as followers of Jesus Christ to tell of the good news that we know to be true in our own lives, right? To share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I can tell you, church, that I think that we need to be more active in that reality in our own walks, in our own lives, that we would be more open to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, we see a society around us, church, that is... It's fallen to the wayside all around us. I mean, you don't have to turn on the news very long to hear something that has happened in our in our culture, in our society today. And you're, you're left thinking, man, how could that even happen in this day and time? Well, it's a lack of the gospel being revealed to those who are in need of the gospel. Amen. Church, we are ambassadors. We are called to be ministers for Jesus Christ and to stand in proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only thing that's going to change society is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the problem isn't what they're doing, it's, it's the heart that is motivating their actions, right? Well, the only, thing, the only person that can change the heart is God. And the only thing that can change the heart is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why the Apostle Paul, beginning in verse 1, right? When he, I mean, chapter 1, when he, when he talks about him, the gospel, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, right? For it is the power of God unto salvation for anyone who would believe. The Apostle Paul says he's not ashamed, and like we talked about, we should not be ashamed also. But be willing to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. But here the Apostle is saying, how would they know unless a preacher is sent? Okay? The God, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians that the God has chosen the foolishness of preaching to bring the good news, to bring the gospel. Alright? We have to make that word known. And there are certain, not all the preachers, in the sense of the, holding the office of of being a preacher, but they are held to a higher accountability. Okay, they're held to a higher standard. Um, the Bible tells us in in Hebrews that let not many of you become teachers, because you will be held to a higher standard, right? A higher accountability. Can I tell you that that scares me sometimes to think about? That means that I'm going to be held responsible for how I handle this word, right? For how I handle the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And church, that is the reality of what Paul is saying, that there are some who are called chosen for that duty, for that responsibility to, to share the good news and to teach it. Okay? Not all are given that particular gift. All have gifts. And all are meant for edifying and the building up of the body of Christ. But some hold the responsibility of being preachers. Okay? And can I tell you, from a personal aspect, I know for myself, I didn't choose it. It chose me. In fact, if you would have told me so many years ago that I would be a preacher, I would have laughed in your face. I would have. Because that just was not my nature or my character. I'm the kind of person I like to be in the background. Listen, don't even look at me, okay? That's, that was my personality. <laughs> what does God do? Well, He puts me on a platform. Right, so that I can be in front of all kinds of people. And that's because it's a call. And it's not something that we choose. It chooses us. And that is what God, Paul is saying here is that there's some that have been chosen for that duty, that responsibility. The Apostle Paul was one of those people. And the Apostle Paul is saying, listen, this word of faith that we are preaching to you, listen, we have no, we can't preach another word. Okay? We can't preach another doctrine, another gospel, because this is what we've been entrusted with. You see, the Apostle Paul here, when he says, when he, in verse 13, he says, for, uh, he says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Listen, it's not the name that saves us. Let me, let me explain that to you. It's the person that saves us. The Bible tells us that, if any, that let not anyone come and preach another Jesus, right? Don't let anyone come and preach another gospel, right? There's a, there's a true gospel and there's a false gospel. The only, the only gospel that has the power to save is the true gospel. It's Jesus and Him crucified. In fact, the Apostle Paul, I love in 1 Corinthians when he tells them, like, I didn't come to you to preach flattering words or persuasive speech. That, that's not my responsibility. That's not what I came to do. I didn't come to impress you. He says, what I came to do was to preach Christ and Him crucified. See, the Apostle Paul understood the duty that he had in, the, in rightly dividing and rightly handling the Word of God. And I want to expound on that a little bit more by taking you over to uh, 2 Timothy. We're going to be reading a lot of Scripture this morning. Um, you know, I, I prefer the Scriptures to teach you rather than me. Okay, that's just my perspective. But we're going to be reading here in chapter 2. Uh, chapter 2, we know the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy and to Titus because uh, there were letters of instruction for them. Both Timothy and Titus were young pastors, young elders, and the Apostle Paul was their mentor. He was training them. He was teaching them. In fact, the Bible says that Timothy was a son to Paul in the faith. And what it means is that the Apostle Paul would say, Timothy, follow me as I follow Christ. <laughs> The Apostle Paul was teaching Timothy here. He was training him on what it is to be uh, an elder, a, a pastor. And here in verses 15, 16, and 17, and if you're visiting with us this morning, uh, Nikki will have these uh, passages on the, script, uh, on the screen here. But the Apostle Paul, speaking to Timothy, says in verses 15, 16, and 17, he says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, the word of faith is the same thing that the Apostle Paul is saying here, the word of truth. Okay, because it's one faith. It's one truth. It's not a plurality of truths. It's one truth. And can I tell you, church, that, that is, that's the biggest struggle that we have in society today, is that we've gotten away from absolute truth. We have embraced other ideology other than the true doctrine, the true faith. And, and it has led not just the outside world astray, but it's led the church astray. And it's led many of the churches to accept and embrace things that are not biblical. Well, it's not my responsibility to teach you any other doctrine than that which is given to us through God's Word. And that's the responsibility that the pastor has. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying to Timothy. Right? He's saying that, listen, if you're going to show yourself a worker approved to God, then you have to rightly divide the word of truth. And the Apostle Paul is going to tell us exactly what the word of truth is here in just a, uh, a couple more chapters and a, couple, a few more verses that we get to. But in verse 16, he says, But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. And what the Apostle Paul is saying here is he's saying, listen, there's going to be those who are going to come and they're going to try to preach and teach a different doctrine, something that is false, something that is not true. And he says, listen, you, Timothy, have been entrusted with this duty. This is your responsibility that you preach the whole counsel of God. 
In verse 17 it says, And their message will spread like cancer. Man, is that not true or what? The false doctrine can spread like cancer, right? And it doesn't just affect, you know, a local congregation. Man, it's spread all over the place. We have gotten to the place in our society today, in the church today, where we're just we're willing to embrace anything that comes along out there, right? For a lot of reasons, a lot of it is out of fear. Fear of rejection, fear of judgment, right? Fear of what somebody might think of us. Well, I can tell you today that if I am going to be true, if a, if a preacher or a pastor is going to be true to his calling, then they must be faithful to the preaching of God's Word. That they don't preach another doctrine. If they preach the doctrine. That's what the Apostle Paul is instructing Timothy on. In fact, it's made even so much more clear in verse in chapter three when he tells us what that word of truth is. In verse uh, in verses sixteen and seventeen of chapter three of Second Timothy, Paul says all scripture. He didn't say some scripture. Okay, he didn't say bits and pieces of it, a here, little here and a little there. He says. All Scripture is what? Given by inspiration of God. And that literally means that all Scripture has been breathed out by God. You see, we can rightly say, like I said, that man wrote this Bible, but it was men who were led by the Spirit of God. And that's why he says that you know all Scripture has been given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable, he says, for doctrine, which is teaching. Uh, for profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And he says, speaking to Timothy, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped, and lack for every good work. He says, listen, if you're going to be complete, Timothy, in, in, in your office as a preacher, then you have to preach the Word of God. Not an ideology, not a thought. You see, Paul was nowhere in, in Paul's instruction to Timothy or Titus where he given them the the opportunity uh, the the permission to teach their their opinion. What he says is he's holding them to a standard, and he's saying the standard is the word of God, and you don't sway, you don't stray from that. And Paul goes on to say in chapter four, beginning with verse one, Paul says to Timothy, he says, "I charge you." That's strong language. He's not saying that you know I'm just giving you. A, you know, an, an, an idea, you know, that you might want to follow. He says, this is your duty. I charge you, he says, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing? I tell you what, church, for, for in, in my perspective as being a preacher, as a pastor, I have to take that into consideration. You see, because I would rather be judged by you than by God. Amen. Amen. My heart's desire is to stand before a holy God and He'll say, well done. Not depart from me, I never knew you. You see, church, we're going to, as pastors, and then this is something that, I mean, that you need to take into consideration. If you ever move from this church to another, take it into consideration. Is that preacher, is he teaching the whole counsel of God? Is he teaching the Word of God? Or is he teaching an opinion? Paul says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom. Preach the Word. There it is. Paul didn't say, you know, yeah, preach your opinion, Timothy. He said, preach the Word. Preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. He didn't say, you know, just make the people feel good. Listen, I... The Word of God has the ability to make us feel good. But it also has the ability to bring great conviction on our hearts. That's how God's Word is living and active in our life. The writer of Hebrews in 4, chapter 4, verse 12 says that the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Church, that is speaking of like a, a physician's scalpel when they go in and they make that precise cut and they go into that area that's in need of, of attention and they do with such great detail and they just get right where is where the where the um, where the affliction is and they get right in the in the center of it and they do what is needed to do in order to bring healing to that. That's what Paul is. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. 
That God's word is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, he says, even to the division of soul and spirits and the joints and the marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and the entire sense of the heart. Can I tell you, church, that is the thing that most people are most scared of when it comes to the Word of God, is that it reveals the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. But can I tell you, church, that is great. We need it in our lives. Amen. We need the revealing of God's Word in our life to show us our affliction, our areas that are of great concern, that we might bring them before God, and there again, come in an agreement with God. We confess our sins to Him. He is faithful. He is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of our unrighteousness. You see, I think there's a misunderstanding of what confession means in the church today. It's not that you're trying to tell God something that God doesn't already know. God is omniscient. He knows all things. What confession is, is God revealing to you what your sin is. And you coming to God in agreement with Him and saying, yes, God, I see that it's sin. And you ask forgiveness, and the Bible says He's faithful. He's just to forgive us. And then He cleanses us of that sin. Nowhere in the, in the, in the Scriptures does it tell us that we can continue in a lifestyle of sin. In fact, we already looked at that in Romans chapter 6 when Paul says, you know, what should we say? Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, certainly not. <laughs> it's not giving us license or permission to continue in. God didn't just save us from the penalty of sin, but also its power over us. That's not to say that we don't make mistakes and we don't fall, you know, short. But what it means is we can't make an excuse for it. It means that we have to come in confession to God, come in agreement with Him, and bring it before His throne of grace and mercy where we will find help in our time of need. That's the reality of the working of the gospel in our lives. But Paul then goes on and he says, For the time will come, we are here. He says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves, teachers. This isn't a popular message in our culture today, in our society today. I, I knew that. I knew that going into it. But I will be held accountable if I don't teach it and preach it right. And this is the true doctrine. This is the true. This is what God is saying. And he says that they will have itching ears and they'll heap up for themselves teachers, right? They will just tell them what they want to hear. That's not what the, the society that we live in is in need of today, church. You know, Haley sent us a, and this is, this is probably controversial, but okay, you know, it, it, God's Word, alright, we're going to stay true to God's Word, okay, sent us a sight of a church in Caney, who, I'll just read to you a little bit of this, let me find it. It says, through prayer, scripture, service, and outreach is a congregation of disciples seeking God in ourselves and the larger community. We welcome all people as sacred and valued children of God, regardless of race, ethnicity. I can't say that word. And I'm on board with all that, right? Yeah. I mean, God is not a respecter of person. It doesn't matter what your color is or where you come from, right? God is God of all. And Jesus died for all. But then they go on to say sexuality, gender, gender identity, and expression, age, family com, uh, com, configuration, physical and mental ability, and cultural and economic privilege or lack thereof. That's where they lost me. Wow. Church, that is not what God's Word says. Now listen, don't get me wrong. And see my heart in this. See my heart in this. God loves the lesbians. I mean, the, the homosexuals. He loves them. But never does He condone the, their sin. In church, we are to love generously and freely. But true love is not just an embracing of an idea of, of actions that are in, in contrast, contrary to God's Word. And that's where they're falling short, church, because they're not... They're not adhering to the true doctrine that is given to us through God's holy word. 
that we are to stand on and, and be firmly grounded and firmly planted on. Otherwise, listen, we will be swayed to the left and right with every wind of doctrine that's out there. God loves them. We too should love them. But church, if we love by just accepting and embracing, that's not true love. Because let me tell you, what you're doing is you're loving them as they're sitting on the bus headed to hell. That's not true love. True love is sharing the gospel, being true to it and saying, listen, God loves you. He gave His Son for you. And there's redemption and there's hope that is found in that. And there's deliverance that is found in that. Paul says, though, that there is a time coming when they will not adhere to sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, speaking to Timothy, you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do not work. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. I don't know how we can look at what we just looked at here this morning and what the Apostle Paul instructed Timothy with and, and say how God is okay with us disobeying His Word if it means to appease people and to make them happy. I, I've told you before, my heart says, my interest is not to build a mega church. I've been given a responsibility, and I want to be true to that responsibility. And if I'm not, if I'm not, I will be held accountable to God. And I'm not saying that to be boastful. I'm just saying that that's in complete humility because I know the weight of responsibility that that carries. And even when it's hard to preach, even when it's a message that doesn't doesn't always make us feel, you know, all bubbly and good inside, it's still necessary. For, for growth and it's necessary to teach and to bring forth. And Paul says, man, that's your duty, that's your ministry, Timothy. But And it's a great need today, probably more so, I feel like more so now today than any, any other time in, in our society today. I've been told before that, you know, as the church goes, so does culture. <laughs> You want to affect the culture around us? This is how it happens. Because church, what, what our society, what America needs today more so than anything else, they don't need another government political leader. They need Jesus. Amen. Because the problem with the church, with, the, with society around us today, church, is a heart issue. And the only one that can change the heart is God. But Paul comes says that faith... True faith, true belief, comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, the Word of truth. Church, let us cling to the truth. Let us be a people of the truth. Let us stand on the truth. And to know that, listen, truth is, is, is not relevant. Truth is truth. And let's be a people of the truth. Amen. 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 Would you please stand as we go into a time of invitation? I just want to encourage you this morning. Listen, if God has ministered or spoke to you in any way this morning, like I tell you every week, don't walk out these doors not having responded to course, I don't ever want to leave an opportunity to give anyone the opportunity of receiving Jesus Christ as Lord, because the Bible is clear as we just look, if you looked at it, if you confess Jesus as Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. Jesus died for you, He gave His life for you, and His gift of salvation is available to you today, and you can confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, and in that moment you will saved. Church, let me also encourage you for those who are followers of Jesus Christ, who have accepted Him as Lord of your life, let's walk it. Let's be an example to a society, a world out there that is lost and they're in need of the gospel of Jesus Christ and you and I have been given the responsibility to be preachers of it. 
Let's be true to it. Let's stand on it. And let's make it known because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for anyone who believes. Would you please come this morning? Invitations open as they play for this song.
Father God, we just want to pray, God, for your blessings over them this year, Lord, that you would just put your hedge protection over them, Father. Uh, God, that you would just uh, protect them spiritually, physically, emotionally, and always, Lord God. Uh, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would, uh, Lord, just bless the work uh, there, Lord, as they as they give of themselves, Lord, and study, and, uh, and, and just give them the ability to comprehend the things, Lord, that... Uh, that they need to, Lord. And um, God, I pray for the teachers, Lord God, that you would just uh, be with them, uh, God, and just give them comfort and peace during this, um, during this school year, Lord. And just pray, God, for your wisdom, uh, Lord, and your protection over them as well. And all those who work within the school system, Lord God, just pray, God, for your, your blessings over them, Lord, and your, and your, uh, just your protection over them, God. Uh, Father, we want to lift up our mission team as well, Lord, and just pray, God, that you would be with them as they minister to these children, Father, uh, God, who have experienced things that are just unimaginable, but God, we know, Lord, that you're the God of all comfort, Lord, and we just want to pray, God, for your comfort, your peace over this, uh, over these young children, Lord God, and, and let these um, who have given up their time, Lord, be your hands and feet over there, Lord, uh, Lord, that you would just minister through them to the needs that are, are that are, are are there in Acuna, Father God. Uh, God, we just thank you. We pray for your protection over them, those traveling there and back, Lord, but also their time spent there, Father God. Just place your hedge of protection around them, Lord. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Wait, y'all y'all all wait. Can we get Tabitha and Henry? I can't see y'all. Can y'all come to the front? Jump up and down. Y'all just make sure, everybody make sure I can see your beautiful face. Find you a window. Find you a window. So while she's making that 
picture if we could have the congregation Are y'all ready? Sing happy Jeez. birthday. Hallelujah. Five, four. His birthday will be Jeez. on Tuesday. And it's a lot. Come on, ladies. So happy.